Joining us now on the line from Irvine, California, Patrick Wall. He is a former Catholic priest and the author of Sex, Priests, and Secret Codes. And Mr. Wall, it's good of you to join us on the line. How are you tonight? Doing well, thank you. Glad to hear it. Let me start by reading, I guess, what is a rather disturbing excerpt from Newsweek magazine from a couple of months ago. It'll set the table for our discussion to come. Barbara Blaine, 53 years old, the founder and president of Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, SNAP for short, a national support group, was one of the several girls who were abused by Chet Warren, a Toledo priest who was defrocked in the mid-80s after she and others filed complaints. She said Warren would take girls out of class at the Catholic school she attended and rape them in his bedroom off the rectory. The first time it happened, she said she was in seventh grade. The abuse continued until she was a senior in high school. It was almost another decade before she told her parents, and even then, she says her father's initial response was that she should just confide in the local bishop. Her experiences have led her to conclude that there is, quote, far more urgency when the victim is male. Do you agree with that sentiment? I agree with that, and I've been talking about that for years, absolutely. And that's been both my experience as a priest and my experience now in the last 10 years uh, working with survivors and uh, other lawyers representing them. Why do you think it seems to be that the church, others, media, maybe society at large seems to be far more concerned about uh, the damage done to young boys as opposed to young girls? Well, there are a couple things. One is the, uh, the inherent Catholic moral theology that's built into all of us who were raised Catholic. And I think the second part is the, the uh, litigious or the juridical reality. And in the Catholic moral department, you have to realize that a, uh, a girl at the age of 14 or 15 to, to Roman Catholic theology can be a temptress. She can be married at the age of 14 if she requests it and her parents give that permission to go forward. So there, there's a double standard of when uh, a child comes of age. The other thing that happens is, remember, the Roman Catholic Church really truly emphasizes the story of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. And in the creation, who brought in evil into this world was the feminine. And then you look towards how uh, Mary Magdalene is interpreted in the Gospels and in the Scriptures. And so there it truly is a negative connotation that comes through uh, the initial Catholic morality. And then I also need to point out there are two uh, doctors of the church, saints, who really have um, almost a misogynistic viewpoint on women in the, in the sense that St. Jerome, you know, the translator of the Bible, and uh, a real true founder of Eastern monasticism, you know, he castrated himself because he couldn't deal with the temptations and he blamed that on women. And then you look at St. Augustine. Um, what did St. Augustine do? St. Augustine had a child, a Deodatus. And St. Augustine left his child and his concubine behind in order to become a churchman. And when you start to look at all these different examples, and then you look at the shame that's built into the young girls uh, from going through catechism all the way through, you start to understand why a young girl can't come forward. Okay, she doesn't I understand. have the tools. I understand the, uh, when you put it that way, uh, all right, I understand some of the history behind it, but, but uh, you know, I'm not sure I remember how old Eve was in the Bible, but I don't think she was 14. And Mary Magdalene, I don't think she was 14. Surely somewhere along the line, priests in their training had to be told that going after 14-year-old girls just wasn't on. Uh, wasn't that the case? Oh, yeah, they knew what the law was. The law has been very clear since at least the 4th century, the Council of Elvira, where if a uh, cleric, being a priest or a bishop, goes after a child, goes after a minor, they are to be dismissed from the clerical state. Um, and it's been consistent all the way through. It's been updated. Uh, they know that, but they also know they can get away with it because the bishops are not going to enforce that particular rule. Hmm. I wonder if you could talk as well about whether or not the homosexuality, which of course is a sin in the church, makes that something worthy of greater attention than say, you know, male-female sex, which of course is fine in the church, although 
clearly not with underage people. Does that play a role in why everybody seems to be more up in arms over uh, priests having uh, abused young boys as opposed to young girls? It does, because remember, one of the basic principles of Catholic moral theology is the natural law. And so uh, natural law would say that sex between a male and a female is proper and, and necessary, whereas sex between males or sex between females is against the natural law and is abhorrent and is another, is another face of evil to the church. Talk to us as well about the nuns. How much, uh, in all of the examples that you know of over the years, how much do, how much do the nuns know and what, what role have they played in all of this? Well, the nuns knew quite a bit. Uh, they were involved, obviously, as the primary caretakers of the children in the schools and in CCD programs. And so they had direct knowledge of what was going on. Um, and the nuns who spoke up were the ones that were disciplined and sent away. And so I, I don't, uh, other than the nuns who are abusers themselves, and there are nuns who abuse both boys and girls, but the majority of nuns who spoke up were pushed down and penalized by the clergy who had the ultimate power. I just want to make sure I understand, when you say abuse, are you saying that there are nuns who sexually abuse young boys and young girls? Absolutely are. There absolutely are. And those cases are going today, and they've been going in, uh, in Canada, they've been going in Ireland, they've been going in the U.S., they were uh, in Australia. Anytime you had a boarding school situation that is ripe uh, for the sexual abuse of minors, and the nuns were always the primary caretakers of the little kids. Hmm. Let me read you another quote, this one from a father, Tom Doyle, who told BBC One Panorama's program uh, a few years ago the following, there is no policy to help the victims, there's absolutely no policy to help those who are trying to help the victims, and there's an unwritten policy to about the existence of the problem. Then, as far as the perpetrators, the priests, when they're discovered, the systemic response has been not to investigate and prosecute, but to move them. To move them from one place to another in a secret way and not reveal why they're being moved. So there's total disregard for the victims, total disregard for the fact that you're going to have a whole new crop of victims in the next place. Now that transcript, as we suggested, is about four and a half years old. Do you have any reason to believe four and a half years later anything's any different? No, nothing has changed. In fact, that is uh, applicable today, and it will probably be applicable in a, a decade from now unless things radically change, because the geographic solution is what I experienced as uh, a young monk and priest, that those particular uh, priests and bishops who offended were moved. Those particular priests and bishops and nuns and other religious were simply sent to another place and the people were never told why they were being sent. And the place from which they were snatched out of and moved from, they were never told why that particular person had moved. So, you know, the, the systematic cover-up and the silence behind this system is, uh, is strong and consistent. Patrick, let me just do a little uh, um sort of personal background on you right now. What years were you a priest? I was ordained in uh, December 1992, uh, ordained early so I could go and fill in for a monk who was withdrawn from a parish. And um, uh, I entered the re religious order in 1988 and, and went through my training, uh, ordained in 1992, sent to uh, various parishes and uh, followed perpetrators. Uh, I had a chance to work on the tribunal in the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, a chance to be a member of the Archdiocese and Finance Council where I saw how budgets were assembled to take care of the problem and to move things around. And, uh, and after a number of years of doing that in 1998, I finally decided that the only way um, I could live my life with, with any kind of uh, clarity and um, any kind of authenticity as a Christian that I had to leave. Now, I gather at one point, though, during your uh, career as a priest, that you performed the role of, I guess, what would be called a fixer. What is that? A fixer, uh, there's at least one guy in every religious order in every diocese. Um, because the sexual abuse of minors is a, is a systemic problem, that, and the policy has been the geographic solution to move the guys, there's always had to be, <clears throat> excuse me, there's always had to be people 
who would go in and follow up that particular perpetrator to try to calm the waters, to search out for new victims, and to uh, try to keep the community calm so that things could continue on as normal. And um, even recently, as a couple, three weeks ago, I had uh, lunch with a former priest in Washington, D.C., who uh, was a fixer in a northeast diocese, and we had the exact same stories. Different parishes, different people, exact same scenarios, exact same type of situations, where you weren't told about what happened, but you, were, you knew there was a sexual abuse case, and you went in to try to pastorally work with the people and to, to seek out further survivors. Is it true that you're a lawyer now? I'm a canon lawyer. I'm not a civil lawyer. No, okay. Sir. So as a canon lawyer, what's your role right now? I'm, um, I'm the, the person who fills the gap to try to level the playing field so that in working with, I will testify obviously, and, uh, and do declarations and, and depositions and such, but my primary role honestly is to working with survivors and to working with uh, civil lawyers so they don't get run over by the culture and by the legal system of the church so they know what to look for because all the information that is required is needed to prove the civil case is all in the church's documents and it's also in the testimony if you uh, get the right people under oath and you ask them the right set of questions your case will be proved and you'll be able to show cases that are 30, 40, even 50 years old. I've seen cases proved uh, prior to 1960 based on the church's documents that they knew that particular priest or bishop was sexually abusing minors. Hmm. Now th there's of course a, a wide swath of opinion on uh, just how well the current pope is handling this file and of course most of what we heard so far is his reaction to uh, priests abusing young boys. How um, informed do you think he is on the issue of priests sexually abusing young girls and how active do you think he has been in trying to do something about it? Well, don't forget our current Pope was an Archbishop in, in Munich in the 1970s and, and early 1980s when a lot of these things were going on. There are cases that are known that, that came to him that he handled as the Archbishop of Munich. Then, as he transferred to Rome, he went into basically the central office of discipline for priests, the Congregation of Doctrine of the Faith, the old holy office of which the Inquisition um, you know, had its doors. And in that particular process, he got to see all the problems from around the world. All 3,300 plus dioceses around the world would send their cases to his congregation. So the information was coming to him. And then more importantly, in 2001, he authored and, and put into effect uh, the new procedure that pretty much dominates how things work right now, Sacramentum Sanctitatis Tutile. And in that procedure, he established jurisdiction over every single case of a sexual abuse of a minor so that it has to go to him. And then he, as a secretary, makes the decision about where the case is going to be handled. It doesn't matter if it was male or female. Every single case between 2001 until the time he was elected and elevated to the pontificate in 2005, he had personal knowledge from around the world. And it's from that knowledge I think he has responsibility. He has responsibility to act, to once you know, you take the, your, the reason, that the God-given ability that you have you take the faith that God has given you and you put those together and it requires action. And that's what the Pope has failed to do. He has failed to act upon the knowledge and the cases that he has personally worked on. Okay, but all things are relative and, and this po certainly the spokespeople for this Pope would tell you that he has done more than any of his predecessors to try to um, bring, you know, Wayward, po uh, wayward priests to justice and to try to get, uh, you know, he's apologized to victims, he's tried to reach out to victims and so on. So, um, okay, he may not be meeting the standards that you want him to meet, but is he doing better than his predecessors? It doesn't matter about his predecessors, to be honest with you. The standard is what would Jesus do? The standard is, are you watching out and protecting the Anawim, the widow, the orphan, the poor, and the alien? 
And uh, they're, they're trying to defend him on different cases by saying, well, it was John Paul II's decision, or it was somebody else's decision. Well, if you're the person with the most knowledge, and you're the person with the power to be able to do something about it, you have an obligation to speak, otherwise you're sinning against silence. Because he had knowledge into this face of evil, and he wasn't telling anybody about it. Now, I appreciate your position on this, Patrick. I appreciate your position, but it, it, in, in another sense, in, in a way that's saying the Pope is the beginning, middle, and end of the church, and he is ultimately responsible for bringing, you know, bringing to a satisfactory conclusion all of those cases that you just so eloquently described. Does that not, though, get off the hook all of the other people, the bishops, the archbishops, other people, the nuns, you know, others who you've described, from their role in, in making sure all of this stops? The problem with the Roman Catholic system is that the bishop, and there have been cases throughout the country, uh, I'm thinking of the cases of uh, Bishop Manny Moreno in Tucson, who in the 1990s is screaming and asking Rome to do something about Father Teta, to do something about Father Trupia. And in those cases, he could not get Rome to act because Rome has all the power. And in this particular monarchical system, the remnant of the Roman Empire, if the Pope does not act, the bishop can't ultimately do anything unless he wants to do the moral thing and call the police. Hmm. The only way for all of this to ultimately stop, and instead of waiting on the Pope to do something, is for the bishops, the religious, and priests to call the police and tell them what they know. So why don't they do that? Then, then we can do something. B because again, that's not what they're supposed to do. In these cases, you take, you promise the pontifical secret. If you're working on these cases, which I did, you have an obligation of confidentiality to the church. Hmm. You have an obligation to that pontifical secret because if you violate that, and this came out in the Cardinal Brady cases in Ireland as well. If you violate that, the penalty is automatic excommunication from the church. You're damned to hell if you say anything. Let me read one last quote to you here, and uh, this is from you. You wrote this uh, just uh, actually about a month ago. Uh, for those who think this is a new story, it isn't. Church documents show that the crime of bishops, priests, deacons, and religious raping and sodomizing children has been known and understood by the Roman papacy for at least a millennium. Pope St. Pius V, from 1566 to 1572, referred to the crime against children in the constitutions of August 30, 1568, as horrendum illud scalus, that horrendous crime. Yes. Uh, you know, are you saying your church has, uh, I, can I still call it your church? Uh, no, I'm pretty much outside the fold. I, I can't consider myself part of them anymore. Okay. Can, I, can we say then that your former church doesn't appear to have learned a darn thing in 500 years? Well, there's never been a real penalty. See, they've always been to, able to survive this and move this around. Uh, the money keeps flowing, and they continue to have power, and they continue to have uh, you know, new people join the church. And the way they've always done that is by not allowing people to know what has happened. And the thing that's different now as compared to five years ago or ten years ago when I was working on these cases is the average person on the street does know about this and that they're not going to know what Pius II taught or they're not going to know what Benedict XIV said in 1741 in his particular procedure, but they know the church has known and that there's a culture within this secret celibate system of allowing children to get raped and sodomized because it's the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with Jesus or anything else. It's about protecting the institution which is man-made. Let me get you to react to an example that uh, many of us are aware of here in this community, Southern Ontario. Uh, the Toronto Star is our largest circulation newspaper in this country and they recently reported on a case that took uh, I guess took part uh, took place rather uh, a couple of hours from here in a small community called St. Catharines. Apparently, the diocese there is waging a countersuit against a woman who was abused 25 years ago. Um, you know, are we going to see more of that kind of thing? The church fighting back litigiously against people who were victimized? 
hey, don't be surprised. This is the remnant of the Roman Empire. This is a warlike system. And if they think they can get away with batting down this one particular survivor or knocking out that one particular survivor, they'll do it. What they can't have happen is a whole other wave of people come forward. Because it's only in silence that this is going to be allowed to continue. And um, they've sued other people. We've had priests actually uh, backslap sue um, different survivors. And it's usually a good thing because in that, in that uh, juridical fight, documents have to come out. And then we have to ta start talking about the whole story about what the diocese knew. We have to start talking about all the different abusers within the diocese. So ultimately, it's a self-defeating um, legal technique, but it's awfully painful for the person, unfortunately, has to go through that. Do you believe, let's just tackle this in our remaining moments here, do you believe this church can heal itself? No, in fact, what, um, I think the only way we're going to be able to take care of this is to have every bishop across the world go down to the local uh, district attorney's office and sign under penalty of perjury that they have gone through their files, they have looked at all of their personnel, and that there are no perpetrators in ministry or they're aware of no perpetrators who, who are still alive, who are around or floating around. And unless we give district attorneys and the police, um, the Gardaí in Ireland, and all Interpol and all kinds of uh, police activities, unless we give them power to actually start to do something, I don't think this church either has a proper incentive, uh, the internal fortitude, or the faith to be able to uh, cleanse this by themselves. I have read that uh, this church is trying very hard to screen potential applicants for the priesthood to see if they have homosexual tendencies or um, you know, tendencies towards pedophilia, that kind of thing. You're smiling already. You don't believe that's uh, on the level? It's a great misdirection. There are so many good homosexual priests that I know that never act out. If they act out, they act out with uh, adult men. They're not interested in children. You know, the, some of the studies coming out of the, out of the South Down Institute in Canada that the bishops own, the Canadian bishops own, are, are, are very clear. The studies coming out of the John Jay College that the vast majority of uh, perpetrators are homosexual men who have abated uh, uh, their, their whole maturation process stopped and they're attracted to children. They have never grown up. And so when they do sexually act out, as the natural law commands them to, they will act out with children. And so this is all backwards. And the church knows this backwards. I mean, this is a basic facts. If you, if you talk to Father Stephen Rossetti or Father Canise Connors, or you read anything of Dr. Bracelin or Father Gerald Fitzgerald, these guys who are experts uh, Dr. Fred Berlin, all these people who have been in this world for a long time. That is complete bullpucky, and the bishops know that. <laughs> That's a technical religious term, I gather. Is that right? That's a <laughs> translation, yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, Patrick, one last question then in our last minute here. You already told us that you really don't regard this church as your church anymore. I wonder if this whole thing has struck you more deeply insofar as it's made you question the existence of God even? No, I, I know that God exists. And the reason I know that is because of the healing that happens with the people I'm working with. And, you know, working with the nearly a thousand survivors uh, over the last 20 years, I know that God exists. I know in my own family. I know in the interactions with my neighbors who are good, good people. I know in, with all the colleagues and the different lawyers I've worked with over the years, there are people who are very good. And I know that inherently we are good people. But sometimes we do bad things, and we need to be disciplined. And this is a grand example where the Pope and the bishops need to be disciplined. Name of the book once again, Sex, Priests, and Secret Codes. Former Catholic priest Patrick Wall has been our guest. Patrick, it's awfully good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks again.